guys, this is the Bulls Talk Podcast brought to you by Toyota uh, in our Points Bet podcast studio. Well, no, sorry. Let me rephrase that. In our podcast studio powered by Points Bet. Yes. That's how you say it. You see, you see the money? Come on now. This is what we, nice. What are we doing? You know, guys, you know how we coming? Let's this go. Is, this is the way uh, a professional pod should be run right here. Yeah. You know? Management Tony. You got to face it, you know? Properly, <laughs> I used to work at Office Depot. I know the product Office has to be Depot. facing forward. You know? I'm down. Uh, and as you can see or hear, with me is Casey Johnson, Bulls Insider for NBC Sports Chicago, and Jason Goff, pre and post game host for your Chicago Bulls, who's going to take a nice. Both of them are going to take a nice vacation sabbatical very soon. Yeah, uh, they need a break. KC needs it more than I. You know, KC has been <laughs> city to city doing this thing like a rock star for years now. Mm-hmm. It's time for KC to unplug and get back to his roots, whatever those roots are, whether it be playing the guitar, or shooting jump shots, <laughs> hanging with the family. Like KC needs to get back to to taking care of KC, fellas. We don't do enough self care. Yeah, you know. So go right now and tell your employer that damn it, I need a week off. <laughs> yeah, you know, how do you how do you feel off. after after that? Season, KC. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I'll let this one breathe. <laughs> uh, you know, they're all the same. <laughs> you're, right, you're right what's in front of you. Uh, I will say, uh, as a veteran of travel, I just said this before we started taping, the Chicago to Toronto, Toronto to Chicago, Chicago to Miami, Miami to Chicago, Ooh. stretching about 60 hours. Taxing. That, that one got me a little bit. Mm-hmm. and it, it, Stuff doesn't usually get me, but that one, that one got me a little bit. But, you know, it's because I'm old. <laughs> and you can't even tell in the writing, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, you so. feel me? Whether he's got his best stuff and he's twirling a gym or whether he's on four hours of sleep over the course there of three were, days. There were a few, few four-hour sleep. Yeah, right? I already know the vibes. Good. Yeah, Casey is a treasure. That should be uh, Thank you. That should well, we're be here. valued. We're here. What so, do we got to talk about? So the season has ended officially. Oh, yeah, there are no more Bulls games. Uh, for the 2022-2023 season, uh, they lose to Miami in their second play-in game. Um, the season, flat-out failure, failure based on what the expectations were yeah. going into this season. They were laid out. Um, they were laid out by AK, um, and we're definitely going to talk about the, the post-game press conference. Um, but I don't, I don't see how you can explain the season other than – they failed with their goal this year. Yeah. It's a complete disappointment. Um, and seeing as how th- a lot of their rotational players played a lot of the games. I mean, you got you know, this isn't one of those things where it's like, oh, uh, this guy missed all this time and then this guy missed all this time. Like is six of your top eight or something played with eighty plus percent of the games or something crazy like that. Six uh, rotation players played seventy four games or more. That's yeah, I mean that's, so you got that's not gonna happen next year, but no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. You know, you got you got a nice little sample size of data and it showed that that core was average together, below average. Um Good defensively, but let's face it, even in the the like in the most important moments, moments yeah. you couldn't tell me that the Bulls defense was gonna get a stop that they needed in in a, in a knockdown drag out game. And you know, these are the things that our tourists and, and Mark Eversley are gonna have to take a look at this offseason. They they've already told you that they feel like they were headed on the right path post all star break. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a Inside as to there, there's going to be tinkers, but there ain't going to be some overhaul. I mean, he, out, he outright said it. So this is um this is a disappointing season, you know, because you knew the Lonzo Ball thing was tenuous at best. I wasn't counting on him playing. So you you take that away from last year, where it's like, oh no, what are we going to do without Lonzo? And it wasn't hanging yeah, over. This yeah, game. it wasn't. Yeah. You understood the assignment, and um, they fell short of it because of lack of recognition, game in and game out. Um, you know, some rotations that were questionable at times. I mean, you can't tell me that Miami game isn't a game for the bigs to win, man. You know, that's that's the Vooch and Andre Drummond game, and we can go home and get ready for Milwaukee. That Miami team was a better matchup than the Toronto game, and they couldn't uh, they couldn't adjust to what was needed in that moment. I think that was a microcosm for the season. Like, you can't you, – you, they couldn't adjust to what was needed in games. Sometimes they couldn't adjust to what was needed when it's time to, you know, lock up a top six spot. 
where it's like, all right, you know, going into the going into the 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 All Star break and coming out of the Paris trip and all these things. There were these moments where it's like, okay, it's coming, it's happening. The team didn't win four games in a row all season long. So if Atlanta could look at their squad and say, hey, this was a disappointing season, there's no way in hell that I think Bulls fans could look at this thing and say that it wasn't disappointing. Yeah, I mean. Uh Man, that any of that Miami game was such a train wreck. Yeah. I, I still haven't. <laughs> I, I, I don't. Yeah. I, obviously, I my job. I don't care if they win or lose, but I just, I just, I haven't. Ha, I've had trouble shaking the end of that game just because it was just like a disaster. Over mm. seven down the stretch. Um, didn't score a field goal after that Kobe three with three. I mean, ninety to eighty seven. And, and the way that Miami was playing, they were just not Beatable. good. Mm-hmm. I, I, I actually was, and I'm already once again proven wrong. I was like. I'm not saying the Bulls um, are a much better team than Miami, but I thought the Bulls would be more competitive against Milwaukee and then what do I know the Heat going there and hang 130 on them in game one. So they looked amazing. But what I saw Friday night from the Heat, totally winnable game. Mm-hmm. Totally winnable game. I still can't believe they lost that game. The Heat just did not play well. So that was a disappointing end to a disappointing season, uh, underachieving season. Arturis said at the start, we want to see improvement. We all read that as win a playoff series. They didn't even get in the playoffs. Right. And as Jason said, they had everybody available. That that was, I mean, other than, you know, Lonzo, there is the crucial yeah. piece of Lonzo. But yeah. you can't hang that much on one guy, man. Yeah. Your big three were available. 82, let's see, Zach missed five games, 77, and I think 74 for DeMar. A lot. <laughs> That's a lot of games. A lot. The, 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 most, yeah. the most minutes of any like, three-man three. unit in the NBA. Yep. Man. And uh, to not get it right, to yeah. not be in the playoffs, yeah, yeah with a, with ten teams having a chance at it, yeah, and, and, and it's pretty it, amazing actually. It's, and, and that was, it, it's unacceptable. But yeah, we can say it's unacceptable because we don't set the terms. You know, mm-hmm. and when when Billy talks about things being unacceptable in the game, or and, you know, um, your identity has to change. Um, when you set the the mission statement as being better than you were the year before, going further in the playoffs than you did the year before, and you fall beneath that, I just wonder to what like if something is unacceptable, then what's next? Right. Like, what are the consequences of it being unacceptable right. when it eventually happens? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of uh, the next step on this is is the the press conference and exit interviews, uh, where a lot of fans weren't really happy with what you know, what said uh, and what was targeted language where uh, the 14 and nine was brought up a lot. <laughs> the post all-star break run uh, was brought up a lot when we're supposed to take the, the entirety of the season in, into account. And a lot of fans were not pleased with what was said um, by management. Um, Casey, you were there. Uh, your thoughts about what, you know, AK said about this season, um, and seeming like it seems like they're gonna stay pat with the with with this roster. Yeah, I mean, to that point, the one thing I would say is he's not gonna come out and bury right. anybody because if right. they do move on from somebody, he's got to keep their value up. So he's not gonna say, "Yeah, we're we're done with Io or we're done with Vooch." And or, if you do bring him back, you've torpedoed right. So own, so yeah. you have to you yeah, have to you mm-hmm. have to put that layer of caveat into the conversation that said I, i'll admit you know 25 minutes in i was somewhat nodding off a little bit <laughs> and, and then i heard a question asked about io because i had already asked about kobe, kobe mm-hmm. and somebody else asked about vooch and i just you know assumed that not everyone's gonna be back and he said yeah we want to bring io back too and, I, and that woke me up I'm like hey, hang on hang on <laughs> you're gonna bring everybody Pretty back bad. which would basically make you a tax team for a team that finished 10th in the Eastern Conference, that's not happening. So then I did ask that question, and obviously he's going to dance around it because, you know, he said he did say ownership. You know, we have support of ownership, but if I were to, you know, want to go in the tax, I'd have to present a compelling argument. I don't think I would assume it was a compelling argument. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> you know, we can tax, finish fifth with this that, guy. <laughs> that's just me. That's just me. Uh, so, so, th- so I, I just, I, I, I'm going to reserve full judgment. Um, but I will th- I will say the two the, the two headlines are they're not going to rebuild, yep. Which we all knew because he told us that in when he made the boost trade, mm-hmm. um, and it did sound like the majority of the core is going to come back, and I just I don't I don't see how that's possible 
because you know obviously you have Vooch has a say in his situation, so that there's that caveat. Um, I just don't see how you can run that three those three back. I just don't. You, I don't. You have the will. evidence, Jay. I don't think they will. <laughs> you got that, the that's evidence. That's why. Last that's time, why. We, last time we talked about this, it was a different feeling and a different vibe. You know, it was you know, what a couple of weeks before the season yeah. was mm-hmm. over. It was last time I was in here with you guys. I don't think they will. And a, and and the sunk cost fallacy yeah. that, that a lot of people like to present, where it's like, oh, if you if you traded Vooch for all these picks, then you got to sign him in the end. I mean, one, you got to make sure that Vooch wants to come back, and two, um, you've seen. Like that might be your wiggle room in terms of changing this team demonstrably is going out and getting somebody who maybe is a run and jump guy who doesn't need the ball as much this way that Patrick Williams ascension can happen because there's one less guy that he has to kind of sit behind in terms of shot attempts or how Vooch plays defensively, how that kind of leaves you open in terms of some of your perimeter um, situations where you have to have Alex Caruso on the floor, you have to have a guy like Patrick Beverly on the floor. Well, maybe just maybe if you put a better defender there, that that makes Demar, you know, passable defensively, or that makes Zach Levine because we saw Zach step his defense up in the end of the. By the way, shout out to did you see what Devin Booker did in Game One. Yeah. Like, it, it, I don't want to hear anything about dudes being premier offensive players and not being able to play the other side of the ball because in the, in the need moments, that dude almost took over that game at the end, but Kawhi Leonard was just too amazing. Right. But he almost took it over defensively, and we don't think of him in that way. So I'm not saying that, that they're going to do something with Vooch or they have to do something with Vooch, but that that would be the only wiggle room that I'd see for this roster changing uh, in a way that affects – you know, not just the fan base, but more so the organization and the team in a way where it's like, okay, this this works to an extent, but how can you really, yeah, like you we, really go forward? I think fans have gotten past the we, – we know Orlando got that one, right? With yeah, it's on cost. Picks, yeah, right. It's, it's, it's kind of over and done. So if, if to make the team better, you have to let the Vooch contract, you know, go – and work something else out and find something else that, you know, will work a little bit better. I don't think there 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 should Probably be any room for like shame they... or, you know, uh, uh, an idea of like, oh well, I made this commitment. Right. Like it didn't it, it's not working. It's not gonna work. So the crazy part Tony, to... we were talking about offense too though. Like yeah. they're talking about them being better offensively because defensively they were decent. You know, mm-hmm. good enough. Obviously top five in so the if ratings. Sl- if you slide the top ten, yeah, you know, and but you, your offense significantly improves by the move. They just they they're in a weird position. Yeah, they really are. They're in yeah. a weird, weird position that and, I don't think a lot of maybe one or two other teams might be in the NBA right now, and those are the teams who are fighting in that playing situation, trying to figure out what the future looks like. What do you have presently? Toronto's What's, in a similar situation. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, look, I think Atlanta is too. Like at some point, they're going to realize that there's only so much winning that you could do with Trey Young as your best player. Yeah, right. Like, I think a lot of teams around the NBA are trying to figure out, like, okay, who's our best player and how, how best can that best player really be? Right. And, and I think the Bulls might be one of those squads. Too. Before we go too far down the let Vooch walk train, mm-hmm. I, I want to I put some context into this, though. This is why mm-hmm. I don't think that's – I think he will be back. It, it, mm-hmm. I, let, me, let me rephrase that. I do, that. too. I think, I think um, if he wants to be back, he'll be back. So right. that's mm-hmm. that's what you need to say because obviously if it gets past July one he has a choice in it. Letting him walk does not create a situation where all of a sudden the Bulls have like all this cap mm-hmm. room. Uh, I don't remember. I think he makes twenty two this year. Twenty two. Um, letting him walk does not mean all of a sudden they have twenty two million dollars of cap room. Well, if, if if he walks, they renounce all their free agents and their cap holds. They'd have about sixteen million dollars worth of cap space. The mid level exception is going up to like. I don't have it in front of me. Eleven point four, eleven point eight million next year. So, you combine that with whatever any other exceptions you have, you can basically equal the amount of cap space that you would have if you let Vooch walk. And who are you getting to replace Vooch for sixteen million? I guess Andre Drummond if he comes back. He's got a player <laughs> option. But but my point is like, I want people to understand like just letting Vooch walk does right. not create. Like this, this whole, perfect situation right. where they can just go out and sign whoever right. they want. Right. Mm-hmm. They can basically achieve in free agency the same things that they could achieve whether the Vooch is on the books or not. So that's something important yeah. to remember. Yeah. 
So they have to run it back. So if they have to run it back, I think what they're going to do is try to get creative with trades, and and obviously use the salary cap exceptions around the the three. Uh, I, I, my antenna's up on Demar. I mean, I don't I don't hmm. know how much value he's got as an expiring deal, but my my antenna's up on Demar. Hmm. That's interesting, especially Very if you want to change. That's just that's total yeah. speculation. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not no, basing yeah, that yeah, on yeah, any yeah, reporting. No, this is just hypothetical right. yeah. conversation. Yeah. But I mean, especially if you're you're trying to change the style of play. Hello, there yeah. you go. If they if they are only getting up 80, 45 field goals a game, and they want to get up to that point where they're around 92, 93, and there's no way in three hell point attempts too. There's no way in hell that you could walk the ball up as much as the Bulls do, mm-hmm. and you know. I'm not asking a long reliever to be a closer. Like, we can't ask people to do something that they don't do. DeMar DeRozan, at this point in his career, is going to be a part of nobody's high pace offense. Right. Right? He's at this point. That's the crazy thing. Everybody wants to play high pace. Yeah. But if the the teams that don't or don't have to, they have some just legitimate world beater who affects winning in a way that isn't being affected here. Right? Like – you know, even the Denver Nuggets, they got a pace where they, they run. They run. And right. Nikola Jokic is part of that because he starts it. And mm-hmm. he's, you know, you can say what you want about his body. The dude actually gets up and down the floor. Like, the, the Lakers aren't a team that runs. You know why? Because they got Anthony Davis and they got LeBron James. Now they brought those other dudes, and those dudes have now picked up the pace a little bit when they're when those when those two want to run. They, they pick their spots. But if you're the Bulls and you're trying to neutralize uh, what other teams are doing – offensively against you and also trying to capitalize on early offense is hard when your lead ball handler or your lead decision maker is a guy who wants to walk it up and get to a certain spot and then you play off of him. Like you can't have both things. Yeah, and I, I was listening. I just wanted to pull up a stab because, to your point, the Bulls tied for third in the league in field goal percentages here at 49%. They get shot more. the you-know-what out you of the get ball. more. The leader was the Nuggets at fifty point four. They're not far off the NBA leading field goal percentage. Mm-hmm. Gotta Simple get more. Math. Gotta get more up. More up and more three pointers up. Yeah, way more. Forty nine percent they shot, but they're the only team in the league not to take thirty three pointers a game. Mm-hmm. It's it's and it, I wonder they, how they, that they changes. They don't play in a modern NBA style at all, mm-hmm. at all. And it, and if you don't do that, you have to do everything very else at a perfect level, very specifically. You know, rebounding, like, yeah. free throw line, yeah, get to the line, yeah, have a top five defense, which they did. Uh, turn the ball, t- turn defense and offense, turn, yeah. turn, and they they were pretty good at that. But that's why they were even uh, um, average, is because they did all those things pretty well, right? Because I mean, they shot the heck out of the ball. It's the reason too why the Lonzo Ball stuff is so concrete so, because. The, the the change that happens, yeah, you can have a DeMar DeRozan on your team if everybody else is like, hey, when it's not his time or when he's, you know, on the periphery of the attack, we're going. Right. We're going. Every chance that we don't – because what's happened with this team is not just because DeMar is slowing down. It's because it, it seems like everybody else slows down even when it's not DeMar's turn. So stylistically, you've turned into that. And in the second half, it seemed like those those young dudes got empowered a lot more. And all of a sudden, you saw Kobe White running. You saw you know Patrick Williams running. It's a coaching thing too, by the way. Yeah, for sure. Like It's a coaching thing as well. For sure. Style yeah. of play. Yeah. Now, to, another point is it's not just about pace. It's also about spacing. Yeah. Because because they didn't take enough three pointers, everything was jammed up Shrunk. inside mm-hmm. the arc. Mm-hmm. What Lonzo did beyond the um, high percentage from three is he took he he took over seven threes a game. So he just helped the spacing on the floor. And then he's obviously obviously a great distributor, connecting piece. You just have to change the profile. You have to change the shot profile. And he, and he mentioned that. Yeah. Um. In, and, in the press in the press conference. Now the scary part about this is that we we we. Is this podcast taped in 2023 or 2022? <laughs> we were saying these things a year ago. Now, in his defense, he targeted Gallinari. The no knee injury was coming. Mm-hmm. Floor spacer, good three point shooter. Added Goron. They got to do more though. They got to get. They got to yeah. get multiple people that can sp- help space the but floor. But the problem is also the, the moves that you've made previously that that you don't have all the resources draft right. capital wise that you would like to have in your, you know, in, in your your. Um, I, the Luke Kennard thing, man. Like, if he was there to be had, 
That, Wait, is that new? I didn't. Miss no, 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 no. I'm just saying, like when oh. when Luke Kennard goes to the Memphis Grizzlies oh, right, right, right. and still shoots the lights out, and you're like, ah, oh, that team made that move, and it changed the dynamic of that squad because they got a bunch of well, they got Desmond Bain, yeah. and then they got a bunch of guys who could sh- actually shoot you out of it. Oh, they're going to lose John the Morant. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> this, is a, this is a five game series. John Morant. I, yeah, I think it's going to go five. John Morant, because especially now that that injury with Ja when he his yeah, fingers hit like the good. floor. And then the wrist goes the other way. Like I haven't seen anything like that. But John Moran's not a great shooter. Dylan Brooks will shoot you out of game as easily as he shoot you into one. The reason why that team changed is because now Desmond Bain is the on one side. <laughs> you got Luke Kennard in the corner. Like, what are you going to do? Right? This this there was too many there was too many swing swings to Derrick Jones Jr. and Alex Caruso and Pat Beverly Javante and guys Green. like that. Javante Green, exactly. So you're asking guys to be Closers when they're long relievers, man. That's you know, it's a tough, it's a tough, you know, this it's a it, hard gig, man. It's a hard <laughs> gig to, to put that puzzle together. Yeah, yeah, right? and and they tried the right. They they added you know Drummond and then Goron, and then they tried the, the all right. We're just gonna coach it differently and play and try and play differently without switching up the personnel, and it ended up not working. Like guys who are who they are. Um, without adding the pieces necessary to actually change the profile, I don't see how you can change the profile without changing the pieces in in the puzzle. I want to see where they finish in pace, what we're talking about, 18th. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bottom third. Yeah, I mean, but this is they got a lot of work to do because we saw some of these same issues last season and mm-hmm. they didn't address them. They just need – I mean, you you guys are probably the same way. I was watching Kings Warriors the other night. I'm oh, like, that's a beautiful. different sport. Oh, my God. Like a different, it didn't different, it look like a different sport? Different, it really yeah. did. Different spirits. Why, why can't the Bulls have nice, shiny things like Malik Monk? Oh, Monk? my God. <laughs> Malik Monk. I mean, that, that, a guy like I that love is, that dude, by the way. Yeah, of course. They had to go to a box and one messing with him. Mm-hmm. Like, that's that's when you when dudes affect the game. Like, I, I think so. Uh, too often we get hung up on, okay, this guy's scoring 28 a game. This is what his value is. No, nah, there's some do like I you know I I appreciate because I got a chance to see some of the old guard that some of the old heads talk about and also appreciate the new style of basketball but I appreciate a dude who you already know hey 15 points is going to happen whether you like it or not. <laughs> He's going to compromise your defense. He is going to do something electrifying. Like people used to talk crazy about J.R. Smith. I loved watching J.R. Yeah. Smith as a player. Yep. One, you got to have a guy who has the balls to take shots. Bully so, funk. Right? You know what I mean? <laughs> and sometimes that dude is going to shoot your star out of a, a you know a rhythm or you got to deal with that during a regular season because in a game like that, Facing down that team, there are certain dudes who aren't scared, and you can't use them too much because you expose them, and then the, the weaknesses, you know, they start to hurt you more than they help yep. you. Malik Monk's one of those dudes. Yeah. There's a lottery pick. There's a dude who went to Kentucky and left early and goes to Charlotte, doesn't you know find his footing, and then lands in Sacramento as a part of one of the, the most historically efficient offenses of all time. And then looking at the Golden State Warriors, not knowing anything like, hey, we, we could play basketball the way you guys play it. Let's watch. Let's see it. Now, I think I think they they parted a little too hard at the end of that game one as if they <laughs> won a championship and the Golden State Warriors are watching that. That's going to be a great series. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be terrific. Yeah. It's going to be terrific. Like, I want the Bulls to play because it's still – tell me if I'm wrong. Aesthetically, even though the East is better than the West, there's still seemingly those different styles of basketball that are being played. Yeah. Right? You've got Milwaukee, and you've got well, Milwaukee's the best shooting team in the NBA, but you, it doesn't feel like it, right? And you, then you've got Philly and Boston who play a certain style as well. Both teams who put up a whole bunch of threes, but for whatever reason, it still seems like to me aesthetically when we watch the Golden State Warriors and we watch the Sacramento Kings, we watch the Denver Nuggets, it feels different. It feels like teams in the Eastern Conference are trying to manufacture three-point shots and just are good at doing it, whereas there's a more free-flowing, oh, by the way, we just found an open three because we we moved the ball and there was player and ball movement in the Western Conference. I think the Bulls have the athletes and the players to play a certain style of basketball it just seems like they're trying to manufacture things as opposed to it happening organically because of the mix and how it doesn't fit in so many ways while we're doing quick uh, playoff homages uh, can we give a shout out to tyler hero for making a three with a broken hand yeah 
Yeah, it's huge. You it's see huge. that shot? Yeah, After yeah. The injury? Yes, yeah. He no, made a three pointer with a broken <laughs> hand, man. And he was this in is, agony while this doing is Kobe it. Kobe moment right there. That was pretty impressive. Right? All right. Yeah. But no, to, I didn't want to. Jason just. This is going to be the red, the the NBA TV series for me, by the way. <laughs> the, the, the Heat and the Bucks. Now mm-hmm. that we're going to get broken Giannis and no Tyler Hero. Mm-hmm. Like the Heat can't score with Tyler Hero healthy. Right. They scored 130 points. I understand, so. but wait, watch what this like thing looks three, like. Yeah. Yeah, watch what this Kevin thing looks like. Yeah, Gabe yeah. Vincent was Come making on, threes. Come on. No, and Ben um, Adebayo should decide to show up offensively. What other what other big takeaways we have to get to from our tourists as press covers? Um, I was I was gonna get to uh, just move on to the the exit interviews and, and the things that you found interesting oh, from the yeah, guys from the on players. the way out. Yeah, from the players. Who said what, KC? <laughs> Zach and Demar said that their duo is strong. And uh, I will say uh, th- there was something new there. I wrote it because, because you know, uh, sometimes as a beat writer, you feel like you've explored every angle and, and every once in a while you're like, oh, I hadn't thought of that one. And it was Damar who brought it up, uh, which I appreciate and I wrote it. He did make up a good point. We can, we can kick it around right here. Between Zach knee, Zach's knee hobbling in the second half of last season, mm-hmm. Zach starting slowly because of the knee management plan mm-hmm. this season, Jamar quietly and sometimes not so quietly battling the quad the second half of this season. They've only been healthy together the first half of last season at the same time. Now, the reason why it's a hard discussion to have is Lonzo Ball was also on the floor for those 35 right. games. But Demar and Zach are like, look what we can do when we're both healthy. And they point to that first half of last season. My, Bucks, only, my only pushback to that would be um, I don't expect any – group to be healthy for right. very long in this league right. the way things are now um and you know Denver Nuggets have had injuries all year long the Bucks have had and I'm, we're talking about championship pedigree teams but they're championship pedigree for a reason I mean, because of the way they're built and also the players that they're built with if that makes any sense yep. like you know you 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 make up for uh, certain deficiencies because you can slide a guy in for a month or you can look at a guy and say, this is the second best player on my team, but he's probably better than the best player on 10, 15 teams. And for this month, we got Drew Holiday who's going to hold it down. Like the Denver Nuggets for the last couple of years have looked a prospect like Michael Porter Jr. in the face and go, you know, whenever you're ready to be healthy, we got you, but we're going to win 50 games a year because of that dude next year. Michael Porter Jr., like we could do the if Michael Porter Jr. was healthy for 65, 70, mm-hmm. that's an all star type talent. Mm-hmm. Like Jamal Murray, after the knee injury, is now the fourth best player on that team. So the teams that you're going up against, the teams that you want to be compared to, are dealing with those things sometimes on a more like a larger scale. And that's the reason why they're there. And the, the Bulls, you know, the roster composition and also some of the things that go on with the guys, like I just. You know, Joel Embiid is the MVP for a lot of reasons, but James Harden with his Achilles down the stretch, I mean, Tyrese Maxey, like they put some people around him, but they they rolled they rolled the boss hog and they got to where they, they got. So I would love for DeMar and Zach to be healthy with each other for an entire season, but I, you know. We've the, had enough evidence. Yeah. In, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Problem. We, I, I, I've, problem we've seen that. the – like Casey, you mentioned all the time when you talk about this grouping and this pairing, there's a ceiling, you know, there. And it's like, what do you, if we can kind of picture where the ceiling is, is why keep going back to it? Like, I get it. Maybe you're not at that ceiling yet, or you haven't been since Lonzo, you know, have been out yep. and, you, and you saw what the ceiling could be. But the point is the ceiling wasn't championship. So it, it, I get they may be cool, you know, with each other, and their relationship might be great. Oh, their relationship's fine. Yeah. yeah. But on court, though, yeah, yeah. is it going to lead to on court success? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Is that what you're getting at? Here? <laughs> the definition of insanity is being insane. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is that saying. The no, definition yeah, of yeah, insanity no, is doing the same thing over and over, yeah, expecting yeah, different yeah. results. Right. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. It just it was in, intriguing to me, just because something I hadn't thought of before. Mm-hmm. But Lonzo's not going to be here next season. So yeah. that's that was the half season that they were both healthy and they were, the Bulls were number one in the East. Lonzo's not walking through that door. Mm-hmm. I mean, sadly enough to say. Yeah, man. So, um, 
yeah, just was something. So that was one headline that jumped out to me. Um, I thought what Kobe said was pretty interesting because he talked about this being a new situation for him. And he basically admitted like, this is the business side of basketball. He did not sound like a guy fully committed to coming back. Now it's, he does not have the same power um, as, as Nikola Luch, Vucevic because yeah. he's restricted and the Bulls can match. Um, he does get helped out a little bit with the 24 hour. Um, yeah, yeah a little bit. You, you know, Kobe, Kobe hit him with the, that decision is above me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's when you know, <laughs> that's when the agent is on the phone. Like, this is what you're going to say for the last week. <laughs> if they ask you any questions, yeah. you know, you'd like to be back, but Hey, and he also made clear, you know, he'd like to be a starter and it, did, did he has he shown enough to be let's say you know Lonzo's not there game one I don't on know. this team he's earned it why wouldn't I talk like that if I'm Kobe White on yeah, this yeah. team looking at the yeah but is he a starting around? point guard I don't mm-hmm. know yeah I think we'll could, figure that out after you sign the check <laughs> if I'm Kobe like, yeah we did this before <laughs> like yeah I'm a draft me it's number seven I'm a point guard you know like <laughs> after you sign that check you can put me in center <laughs> like we I mean, his best chance to do to start right it will be here. Right, if you're looking at the landscape of the NBA, who would give him that quality? Oh, I'd have to look at like all yeah, the stuff. Yeah, I mean, we have to deep guards. dive, but I'm thinking like the most likely situation for him to do that is here. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I haven't, like I said, I, I haven't dived into off season stuff yet. Mm-hmm. So. Well, I mean, Bucks got themselves a point guard. Celtics have themselves a point guard. 76ers have a lead guard. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cavs have two of them. The Knicks just signed one. The Brooklyn Nets, right? Yeah. Uh, the Atlanta Hawks. I don't know. I don't know people. I don't know the team's cap situation yet. We're, yeah, we got yeah. all off season. Yeah, we got we got, we got time. Free agency yeah. July one, Tony. Come on. Man. <laughs> yeah. But I, it was just interesting to me that how he talked about. You know, he was he was pretty. Uh, he was playing it down the middle. Yeah, he he was aware that you know he should. Yeah, he, he should. should. The, the season that he I had, love it. I love he, it. He should feel. You in only power. get leverage of uh, you know a couple of times in your life. Might as well use it in these instances. Say, hey, I don't know. Hopefully, there's a market that's driven up for me, and I come back here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Or you know, you go to Washington and go do what you got to do. Like, I mean, he's 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 got options, and this is what hard work does. Yep. His hard work and his development has paid off. You know, mm-hmm. kept his head down all amidst all the talk over the last couple of years. Tried to find like finding yourself as an adult <laughs> and as yeah. a professional at the same time in front of millions of people. I don't think we give enough um, enough gravity to that circumstance. So when these dudes do figure something out, yeah, talk your stuff like go get every dollar you possibly can. Because when it was time to ship Kobe out of here, mm-hmm. we weren't quiet about that. He was quiet, yep. right? So now, you know, get as loud as you need to get in a, in a professional way, and that's what he's supposed to do. Yeah. I, I, whatever happens, happens. You know, I, I'd like being here, but if they see different, keep it moving. Uh, two more questions uh, before we wrap up. We got to uh, get to the clutch player real quick too. Yeah, yeah, we do that. Uh, do they bring or, or look at Pat Bev? return you know that did not even come up in the exit meetings mm-hmm. and to me he's uh he's a end of the off season if he's still around an and extra. there's a minimum and it fits mm-hmm. kind of thing okay all right uh and uh patrick williams um his season you know this year started you know for the first half and then back half the well before that he was Billy Donovan was intended to have him come off the bench, but couldn't because the Javante Green uh, injury happened. So he plays him back in the starting lineup. And then they get Patrick Beverly. He goes back uh, to the bench where we saw some slight success. Um, some steps. Yeah, some steps were taken for for Patrick Williams. So your analysis, you two, on Patrick's uh, season this year. I mean, this is the first one that he's – hey, shout out to him for playing all 82. 82. Right? Um, I mean, he came in with – COVID season, <laughs> training camp issues, breaks his wrist. Um, you know, you got to figure out if, if this is a guy that you're going forward with after next year and qualifying offer and all the other stuff that goes into play. Uh, I, I reset, you know, I was talking to um, Bill Wennington and Stacey King with uh, Lawrence Holmes and Layla Rahimi on the score about this. I reset and recalibrate my expectations for him so that I can be surprised rather than disappointed. 
And when you get those moments where he's like, oh, there it is, there it is, I just look at it as the, okay, he does this once a game or, you know, twice a week where it's like, okay, there it is. But now you just have to refine that. The there it is has to become more consistent. So I'm not, I wouldn't ask of him certain things. And on top of it, you know, We've seen him when he's been aggressive. It's been quite evident. It's when Zach Levine and DeMar DeRozan aren't on the floor. It's when he's, he's, you know, when he's coming off the bench or with that second unit and the ball is placed in his hands. He doesn't get a lot of plays called for him. You know, the 3 and D thing, I think, is like the, the, the place that people want to put him. I'd, you know, how quickly he gets off that three-point shot – if we're talking about a corner, because I, I see, and I could be wrong and take a look at the numbers, but you know, I see a lot of histories coming from the wings. You put him in the corner and ask him to be a three and D guy. That's a shorter closeout, dudes. You know, you got to get rid of that thing. And I think Patrick's release is, you know, still um, in uh, progress, a work in progress yeah. in terms of how fast he can get it off. But yeah, I, I think he could be a very, very good defender. And I think he could be a guy who you can ask to score 12, 13, 14 points, all the stuff, the lofty ex- expectations I had before. Uh, they've kind of subsided, and now it's like, okay, what do you have in the player? And, you know, you'd be a senior in college this year, right? Yeah. So it's like some dudes come along differently. Um, you look at Lowry, you look at, you know, you look at Kobe. Um, do you want to be, do you want to, you know, be bitten by that snake again where it's like, oh, you let a guy go. And you can't play with scared money either. Mm-hmm. You got to make a decision on this guy. It just sucks that for three years now we've only seen him really for one year where it's like, okay, this is the template. Like this is the foundation for who he is. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's weird because on the one hand, like he, I, I think there's a lot of progress with him as yeah. a bench player. Like I thought he was better. He made more of an impact coming off the bench. Um, it's noticeable. Um, so I, I, th- that's the – plus side but on, on the other side is like do you want don't you want him to be a starter at some point right and nope. do you need to do you need to trade DeMar to make that <laughs> happen or I'm not I know they don't play the te- same position technically although I still see some some three in him so over four yeah, I know it's positionless, yeah. but I think he changes his body slightly and we're talking about uh, a slashing player who's got a capable enough handle that you can give, you can ask him to shoot the ball 12, 13 times a game, and you know, five or six drives, try to figure out what he is. Because, you know, Stacy brought it up in that Milwaukee series where they were doing some of that pick and roll stuff with him and Vooch. Like, there were some moments where he's like, okay, this this might work. Also, you, you know, it's the coaching aspect to it as well. Like, mm-hmm. you got to, if you really value him, like the way our tourist values him, if you're Billy Donovan, then you got to put him in positions where he can, he's forced to show you what he is and what he isn't instead of these, you know, you get the ball because somebody else didn't have something. To right. Us. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, you'd like to see more consistent rebounding for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. that's still, uh, but um, I'd say overall a positive season, especially in that bench role, mm-hmm. but you just still want a little bit more, more. from him. You know, I worry that he's going to be the guy that keeps you wanting more yeah. for the rest of his career. Mm. Um, and that's not a bad, like, Stacy brought up Jeff Green. Like Jeff Green, I think, has, has had a pretty damn fine career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you know, there's been injury issues, but you know, he's he's been an impactful dude for every one of the teams he's played on. Now is the lottery pick, Georgetown, fresh out the box. You know, Jeff Green, the expectations we have for that dude with that body and that athleticism. Hell, Jeff Green, once a year, he's 20, 18 years in, something like that. He's still catching somebody once a year where mm-hmm. it's like, oh, yeah, Jeff Green still does that to people, right? <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, you know, and like I said, I'm crediting Stacy because he mentioned this and then it, it sparked something. But uh, maybe, just maybe recalibrating you know, this is where he is and – Maybe just maybe the fourth pick in the draft doesn't you, – you don't have to put that on his head when you introduce him from here on out. You just actually say what he is instead of hoping that he'll be something else. Clutch player. What you got to read to do while I look up the uh, – Clutch. Oh, I guess I could do oh, that. Yeah, see, look at me. I'm clutch. Looking, looking clutch. All right. So, producing up. this thing. He's making sure people don't stare him in the eye on the walk-in. <laughs> He's clearing out rooms. 
I like to call him Casey Yance. Casey Yance. Read your read, Tony. <laughs> feel the power with points bet all the way through April and May. Points bet is giving away bonus bets every single day between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. Central with points bet power hour. Once the clock hits 5 p.m., your bonus bet drops and the power is in your hands. Download the points bet app today using code SHYTALK. And set your watch for Power Hour at 5 p.m. Central. Points bet. Your move. Is it C-H-I? C-H-I talk. I'm just making sure. No spaces. Some out there. See, that was not only a read, that was a stall. Because I was pretty sure the third finalist was Jimmy Butler, but I had to confirm. So anyway, Mm -hmm. this first year, uh, uh, the the NBA. Yeah, we're going to have our little short discussion on this because it's going to be. I can't remember when that award's going to be announced. It might be this week. First year they're doing the NBA Clutch Player Award. Mm -hmm. Finalists are Jimmy Butler, uh, DeMar DeRozan, okay. and De'Aaron Fox. Who wants to go first? I have thoughts. <laughs> I have strong thoughts. Rare time well, I have strong thoughts. I feel like I feel like you should be disqualified if your team is below 500. Thank you. That is fair. There's one. Because how clutch. Shout out to DeMar DeRozan's career. And if this yeah. award was awarded last year, he would have won it going away. Yeah, mm-hmm. 46 terrific. and 36. NBA history with those buzzer beating three pointers mm-hmm. on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. They won Le- six games last year. Yeah, Bulls. Jesus. Yes, led the NBA. <laughs> in fourth, the mighty have fallen. Led, led, led the NBA in fourth quarter score. Yeah. If this if this award was was last year ha- handed mm-hmm. out last year for the first time, Demar Derozan would have, would have been won. your NBA Clutch Player of the Year. He is not this year. No, no. And the winner is to me is not close. Beam it up. Yeah, I, I think it's De'Aaron Fox. Get up. I mean, and then I mean, if he didn't I have sh- stats, so you guys riff on. I'm just saying, if he, if he have have, if he didn't show you that in the first game of his playoff Hello. career, <laughs> he got thirty eight on you on the reigning champs. I mean, I think thirteen in the fourth. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I loved watching De'Aaron Fox back in Kentucky with him and Lonzo Ball matched up in that that uh, tournament game, mm-hmm. where it's like, okay, you're gonna see this for a while, and obviously the, the fates have have been different. Um, it's a guy who got the max. It's a guy who my guy, Amin El Hassan, famously said, you know, you're not John Morant. You know, you're overvaluing yourself or something to that effect. And De'Aaron Fox is taking it personally. <laughs> <laughs> and these last couple of years, he's really sprouted. And let's face it, man, my guy Tyrese Halliburton, they they, they made a trade that opened up De'Aaron Fox's game even more because they got a guy, Demonis Sabonis, who – Shoots the ball well, but doesn't shoot a lot Enough, of them. Yeah. So De'Aaron can go out there and do what he has to do. Um, they put a terrific team around him. Like he's he's had himself a sensational season, first time All Star, if I'm not mistaken, too. So this is a banner year for that dude. I I have always believed in De'Aaron Fox's talent. Yeah, likewise, um, I had no doubt in my mind. I thought I didn't think he had enough talent to overcome. Everything Kings, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I I did believe that he is a a piece that you keep um, to build around, and I, you know I liked Tyrese Halliburton, but they had to make a choice. Yeah, no, I understood yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, they they had to make a choice, it. and they went with the guy that they were you know, more <laughs> more familiar with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know that dynamic between him and Sabonis, where Sabonis doesn't mind taking you know twelve you know shots a game, thirteen shots a game, because he's going to make the most of his. Uh, the what he does with his passing, and uh, they have a lot of floor spacers out there too, shooting wise, uh, to help De'Aaron Fox, and he's really has sh- shined through this year uh, in a way that everybody notices, and not just like you know the underground people that hey, yeah, love you basketball. know what know my secret secret watch is De'Aaron Fox. Yeah. Like now everybody knows how how good De'Aaron Fox is. So the Kings tied for fifth in clutch victories with twenty. Five? No, I'm sorry. They tied for six in clutch victories with 25. So that's not just all one player. But then you go to fourth quarter scoring. De'Aaron Fox, sixth in the league in fourth quarter scoring at 7.8. DeMar, 12th in the league at 7.1. You know, DeMar's in the – this is why he's a finalist. He had 100%. it. He, he, yeah. he is a clutch player. Mm-hmm. But yeah. De'Aaron Fox is, to yeah. me, the runaway winner. Jimmy's not even on here. I mean, he, he does have a knack of producing – but he's not even. How does Jimmy qualify for all this stuff? I feel like Jimmy doesn't play uh, for like the first two wa- months. Watch, and then uh, just... watch, 
Well, watch the fourth quarter of uh, the, the Heat yeah. Bulls game. That's how they qualify yeah. <laughs> yeah. when you really need a win. Mm-hmm. Or, or watch player. the game one of the Buck series mm-hmm. when you really need a win. Like he's gonna be. Yeah, he didn't like, care about the regular season. At yeah, this point. that's yeah. that's a crazy Stay thing. Stay in shape. Don't get hurt too mm-hmm. bad. Yep. And get to the postseason and do work. Yep. So I think we all agree. De'Aaron Fox is your clutch winner, and it's unfortunate because. Tomorrow would have won last just year. Just a year, yeah, yeah. a year or two. Hey, he's a finalist this year. He but, gets his name called out by uh, Kenny Smith. I think, yeah, I think tomorrow's going to be okay. Yeah. yeah. I think he's going to be quite all right. All right. So we've decided a clutch player. Yeah. yeah. Shout right. out to De'Aaron Fox. Yeah. <laughs> One of the best players. Uh, as these right. roll in, we'll discuss, you know, in, in detail as these, uh, these awards. Obviously, MVP has been very contentious. Kendrick Perkins has changed now. the entire narrative yeah, of the MVP, you know, award. So it's going to be. Uh, interesting discussion. Uh, this has been, oh, unless Casey, you got no, something good. else? That's, that's we're good. done. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. Uh, oh, this has man. been Bulls Talk Podcast, uh, brought to you by Toyota. Seems like uh, it just in started. Our, in our Points Bet uh, podcast studios. Thanks a lot, you guys, for coming in. Clutch yeah, player man. Tuesday night, if we're, we're, we're whenever you're listening to this. Just Tuesday night. Tuesday that's night. That's when they're okay. announcing it. Yep. We're yeah. taping this on Monday. Uh, tonight is Defensive Player of the Year, so by the time you listen to this. Who who you think oh, we're going to do that? No, so no. We, Okay. Okay. Because no, there's no bull. We only we, we that's we only the, do bulls. We only did the the bulls. Is it, that's the only finals the bulls have for any person? Oh no, no. I'm <laughs> talking about. Uh, are we, we gonna t- discuss it? Oh, okay. You're right. You're right. You're right. My bad. I'm gonna be quiet. Huh? Now. Well, I'm producing again. <laughs> right. Casey yeah. has spoken. Casey the, pr- the yeah. producer. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this comes out uh, on Tuesday, and uh, the clutch player of the year is announced Tuesday night. So depending okay. on when you're listening, there it is. All right, there it is. Aaron Fox will be your winner. We have made our prediction. Book it. So, so it is done. <laughs> All right, All right. Catch you guys on the next episode of the Bulls Talk Podcast. Again, we're going to have a lot of interesting stuff uh, coming up during the offseason, a lot of interesting interviews. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. We'll catch you guys next time. Peace.